Some gamers out there can't stop when given a challenge. And that's really why they do it. Not necessarily for recognition, but that's exactly what we're gonna give them today. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 more gamers who did the impossible. Uh, and before we get going, we actually did a previous video of these in case you're looking for some other equally impressive feats, like beating every Dark Souls game without getting hit, Resident Evil 2 Remake, no damage, no save, not pressing the A button in Mario 64. I mean, there's a lot of good ones. Some pretty crazy stuff. But without any further ado, let's get into this one. Starting out with number 10, somebody actually beat every mainline Assassin's Creed game without getting hit. And you're probably thinking like, that's a lot of games. It's a ton, it's 12 games. It took him nine months. The player goes by the name Hayat and it just, this is one that he started in 2021 and finished in April 2022, and it took 950 hours. So again, 950 hours, nine months, zero hits, did not get hit a single time. Like, that's absurd. I'm assuming that if he got hit that he documented it on his YouTube channel, which... I don't know exactly how much of it he showed, but that's just such an absurd, long, laborious, difficult challenge. He also offered some notes saying his favorite of all of the games, the most balanced between story, mechanics, and just coming together, well, it's Odyssey. And although he thought probably the least good game was Assassin's Creed, it probably had the best story in terms of explaining the assassins. And then also the game with the worst story, Assassin's Creed Unity, was also the one with the best stealth. He actually detailed a pretty long post about this kind of stuff. And it's, I think, pretty good insights. It makes sense when you don't get hit to have seen a few of the extra little third rail things about the games, but that's an incredibly dedicated challenge. Well done, Hayet. Moving on to number nine. In the last video, we covered a guy who beat every Dark Souls game without getting hit. And today we're gonna cover somebody who just did Dark Souls 3 without taking a single hit um, with the Guitar Hero controller. So, <laughs> There's a lot of instances of people attempting Dark Souls with a lot of strange controllers. And like, it's impressive when people win the game, period. It's not even kind of easy to take on Dark Souls with a non-standard controller, but the Guitar Hero controller is kind of a special beast. It's really, really specific in what it's set up for. Um, the Guitar Hero game specifically. <laughs> and on top of that, this guy, Mez Plays, didn't just beat it like with the Guitar Hero controller, he did it fast. It was incredibly impressive the speed that he takes this game down with. He did like skip all the optional bosses and did anything he could to make the story run shorter, but that's like a lot faster than an average story only run. Just to have done it without taking a hit on a weird controller, it's impressive. And number eight, a challenge that YouTuber Critical actually put a huge bounty out on. He said, if you could beat Halo 2 on the highest difficulty setting with every skull activated without dying, he would give you $20,000. Now, of course, that is an absolutely, totally absurd challenge known as the Lasso Deathless Challenge. So here's the trick. Critical, whose real name is Charles White Jr., said you have to stream the whole thing because obviously there can't be any cheating. If anybody finds any evidence of cheating, that stuff has got to be taken care of, figured out, just to understand what's going on, you know? Now, originally his bounty was only $5,000 though, and it took a couple of months of nobody doing it for him to go, all right, I'm adding 15,000 to that. So this streamer by the name of Jervalin, who is actually not like a big streamer or anything, just somebody who had set a few world records in Halo, actually did it. In Critical's opinion, this was actually the hardest challenge in all of gaming. Jervalin didn't like freak out or anything when he managed it either. He just kind of said, you know, I would have thought this was impossible and it wasn't. I mean, I don't know what's more impressive, that he was that chill about getting $20,000 or the challenge itself. 
At number seven, a YouTuber by the name of Mythical kind of did something like really, really impressive in Minecraft, which to be clear, isn't really the same thing as a lot of other games. You, you don't have the same kind of accomplishments or, I mean, you have achievements and stuff, but they're not set forward with really finite goals. Mythical decided he was gonna mine like all of the blocks, which is just an insane goal. And over the course of about five years, he, he mined away about 45 million blocks. And it's, it's easily one of the most insane looking things of all time. The map itself, with him basically at bedrock, and there's like barely anything left, looks insane. It, it looks totally insane. In the live stream he did near the end of it, he talks about like how he had to store blocks and how he had to prepare the diamond pickaxes. And I mean, this is somebody who mined away 45 million blocks just cause. That's nuts. And, and really, frankly, sounds impossible, but clearly where there is a will, there is a way. At number six, a gentleman by the name of Luke Steelman obtained the impossible arrow in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So let's talk about what that is before we get into it. So when you're making any game, there's little things that get placed or forgotten or end up somewhere that you don't expect. And when you make an open world game, the likelihood of this stuff being overlooked later and just left in the game is a lot higher. Now, Breath of the Wild is probably one of the coolest, most impressive open worlds ever built, just in terms of not necessarily density, but design. And despite all of the deliberate time put into the world, it still has some impossible stuff. For instance, in uh, April of 2021, somebody discovered that there was an arrow above Gerudo Town, just like up in the air, something that you could never expect to get to unless you use glitches. Now, the main glitch that people tried to utilize was a glitch involving a horse that allowed you to moon jump, which supposedly works kind of like an infinite jump. However, it was too inaccurate to get there. So a YouTuber by the name of Steel Man combined it with a glitch that allows you to use the Guardian kind of as a airship and you combine it with a couple of other glitches. Like, it's really complex. You can see. Like, the whole thing's totally insane. And he managed to get the arrow, which was thought to be just something that wasn't going to happen. At number five, a, a guy did a pacifist run in World of Warcraft and reached max level by only picking flowers. So this one requires just a little bit of explanation. Uh, the guy's name's Double Agent, and he's actually done this before. Back in 2016, he had spent like 8,000 in-game hours picking flowers to reach the max level, which was capped at 110 for the Legion expansion. Basically, he had just gone on and on and on and then did the same thing again in 2018 when the battle for Azeroth expansion launched and the cap was raised to 120. He said that was an additional 240 hours. Now, so Shadowlands launched back in 2020 and had a level cap down at 60. He started completely over and hit that cap without leaving the Wandering Isle, like the, the intro place, the thing that you don't stay in if you want to reach max level, period. But Double Agent did it, and again, it's totally insane. Blizzard was so impressed by this, they made an NPC of his character. And I think he deserves that sort of recognition, you know? He came up with a totally different way of playing the game and reached max level. It's really impressive, actually. Also, took an incredible amount of dedication. Frankly, wandering around picking flowers is not the most fun thing you can do in that game. And number four, speaking of going uh, to the max level without leaving the first area of the game, somebody did it in a game that doesn't have that same kind of introductory area. Final Fantasy VII is a game that kind of places you right in the middle of the action, although it still kind of uses that action to tell you about the game. A guy by the name of Circle Master grinded both Cloud and Barrett to level 99 in the first area before facing the first boss. And probably the best thing about it is it took him years and did it literally to spite somebody by the name of Dick Tree on a forum. Not an open forum, a private forum. He said he decided to do this because this guy on 
This private forum named Dicktree claimed that he would be able to hit level 99 in Final Fantasy VII without leaving the Sector 1 reactor. Well, he couldn't. Either that or he stopped tracking it. Probably means that he couldn't. And in 2015, Circle Master decided to, and I quote, express my hatred and more importantly, my disdain for Dicktree began the task. This took about 500 hours. And not like on the PC or using emulation. He did it on an actual PS1. He posted a message about this being a meaningless accomplishment, but that life is meaningless and that we do these things to give meaning. He said he wanted to prove to himself and others on the forum that he can persevere and wanted to express camaraderie for those who followed Dick Tree for several years and were ultimately disappointed by his not following through. At number three in old school RuneScape, not standard RuneScape, might I add, the less advanced one, a, a guy by the name of Lynx Titan got 200 million experience on every single skill in the game, which various people have done the math would take at least 30,000 hours. In old school, not standard, old school RuneScape, the well, I'm not saying that standard RuneScape is the least clunky thing ever made, but old school RuneScape, wow, there's not really a lot else to say about this. It's incredible that somebody would take that much time in old school RuneScape doing this. At number two, Asheron's Call had this event called Shard of the Herald. And if we're going to be completely frank, there's too much here to completely explain. It's not often covered in a way that really fills out the context. I'm going to go ahead and cop to the fact that I was not there. I was not playing Asheron's Call at the time. And therefore, I do not understand the lore. I did a large amount of research hoping that I was going to be able to condense it down into a short period of time. That's not possible. But... I can recommend you an absolutely fantastic video that does explain it from the point of view of an actual person who took part in it. It's narrated by somebody named Andrew Ross who goes into all of these things that I don't have a frame of reference for, gonna be completely honest. I played Asheron's Call a little bit, and what ended up happening was one of the servers called Thistledown managed to essentially create a situation where they were the ones that created the lore. Uh, whereas in an MMORPG, typically the developers do it. And I don't, it, there's so much information. It is totally insane. And it's really cool. It definitely set a template for future MMORPGs to bring in players as part of the storytelling. And finally, at number one, this one, in my opinion, is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. And it's less about like an accomplishment that you can actually achieve in game and more about breaking the game. So using a standard Super Mario World piece of software, doing no memory hacking with like a game genie or any of that, somebody used just regular button inputs into a Super Nintendo and reprogrammed Super Mario World to play Pong and Snake. And like this needs to just be said, it's one of the most insane things you will ever see in your life. If you're unfamiliar, it is tool assisted, so it's not like somebody put in all of these inputs on a controller because it's it's literally at the level of like the frame rate like 1 30th of a second you have to input something and then they dump a, a ton of code into the game itself after they just totally break the way that it manages memory now what's cool though is they didn't just run it on an emulator they ran it on an actual super nintendo and they did this back in 2014 so it was a while back but still that super nintendo was probably nice and yellow by that point you know how that plastic just ages to this fine pea yellow color it's just in, in impossible that people even come up with this stuff for me i'm so impressed by it like this was a game that i played when i was a kid and somebody was able to totally break it on real hardware and program their own game into the console without like a game genie or modifying the code just like 
button inputs. A machine did the inputs to be clear, but it's still just so impressive to even figure any of this crap out. A uh, quick bonus for you. In an elaborate marketing stunt that some people did to market a mod for Nier Automata, they kind of hoaxed everybody into thinking that somebody found a new area in the game. But apparently they came up with these incredible new modding tools that integrate with Blender. And frankly, it's uh, really cool that they were able to add something totally new to the game that nobody thought was possible because mods for near automata never were that extensive prior so it was just something that everybody got incredibly excited about because it basically meant people were going to be able to do a lot of new cool stuff with the game and that's all for today leave us a comment let us know what you think if you like this video click like if you're not subscribed now's a great time to do so we upload brand new videos every day of the week best way to see them first is of course the subscriptions click subscribe don't forget to enable notifications and as always we thank you very much for watching this video i'm falcon you can follow me on twitter at falcon hero we'll see you next time right here on game ranks and right here on